Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, I am uh, Dimitri Perolis, uh, the Head of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, very special event. Um, this is the Purdue Engineering uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. And uh, we started the series back in 2018, where we're inviting uh, world-renowned faculty and professionals to Purdue Engineering to encourage thought-provoking conversations and ideas with our faculty and students uh, regarding the grand challenges that we are facing. Um, our uh, distinguished speaker uh, typically presents a lecture to a wide audience of Purdue uh, faculty, uh, graduate students and undergraduate students, followed by um, an interactive panel um, with um, Purdue uh, experts as well. Uh, so to introduce our distinguished speaker, um, we will have our Dean of Engineering, uh, Dr. Mang Chiang. And after the introduction, I will cover a couple of the logistics of uh, how we will uh, conduct uh, today's uh, lecture. Uh, Dr. Chiang. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Meng. And uh, as uh, Purdue Engineering uh, aspires to the pinnacle of excellence at scale, we welcome the visit, perhaps virtual these days, uh, to Purdue Engineering from a truly outstanding uh, distinguished speakers, such as today's speaker at the Purdue Distinguished Engineering Lecture Series. Uh, now, I do have to brag uh, as part of my job description. First, the Purdue Engineering Research and Grad Program is ranked this year as number four in the United States. And our enrollment size, undergrad, master, and PhD, equals the summation, roughly, of the enrollment sizes of uh, those three ranked number one, two, and three in the country. Uh, I believe that uh, no other engineering school with as many as 14,000 in-residence students have ever attained to the top five uh, in the United States. So we are immensely proud of our faculty, students, staffs, accomplishments. And uh, we are deeply appreciative of uh, the outstanding speakers who are willing to uh, discuss their research and their vision to a broad audience with us. Uh, and today's speaker, is someone that I have admired for a long time and have had the pleasure to work with uh, over the past couple of years on various projects. And I'm glad to also say that uh, he's starting this month, also the new Armstrong Distinguished Visiting Professor to Purdue's College of Engineering, Dr. Marcus Weldon. Uh, and I'll have to compress uh, the introduction of uh, Marcus uh, resume to just two minutes, otherwise it will eat into his uh, presentation about our collective future. Uh, well, uh, Marcus Weldon uh, became the CTO for Alcatel-Lucent in 2009, uh, and then in 2013, he succeeded uh, John Kim as the 13th president of Bell Labs, the iconic innovation engine for this country and much of the world. And then in 2016, following Nokia's acquisition of Alcatel-Lucent, he became also the corporate chief technology officer for Nokia. And over the past a decade and more in these critical leadership positions of global technology innovation, uh, Marcus has launched many important projects, including those in communications, but also broadly speaking, such as the Bell Labs Prize and the Future X projects, which were all launched during his tenure. And he also is well known to be an advocate for the interactions between arts and technology and between uh, the virtual and the physical size of engineering, which is precisely uh, something that where uh, the Boilermaker engineers are very good at. And uh, until last month, uh, as the president of Bell Labs, uh, Marcus has had a particularly remarkable impact to the evolution of solutions such as advanced communications, 5G, such as artificial intelligence, such as quantum computing and other types of applied science. And he, of course, he himself was trained at Harvard as a, a physical chemists, but the impact that he has had has been broad and deep. 
uh, we are truly delighted to welcome Marcus to share with us his views uh, coming from a decade long leadership at Bell Labs uh, and coming from his insight uh, leading uh, the technology operation of uh, two of the most uh, celebrated companies in the world of technology. So with that, I first turn it back to Dimitri to talk about the logistics and then uh, very warmly welcoming uh, my friend and great colleague now, Marcus Welder. That's wonderful. And as we welcome Marcus, I just wanted to say that uh, Marcus has been very kind to uh, make this an interactive uh, discussion. Um, I think we would very much enjoy uh, having your questions that uh, Marcus can address as he uh, speaks. So I'd like to encourage everybody to um, uh, think and put your questions in the chat box. And periodically, um, with Marcus' permission, I will interrupt him and uh, pose those questions. So thank you so much, uh, Marcus. Thank you both. Uh, it really is an honor to be here. And uh, my initial enthusiasm for the Neil Armstrong visiting professorship that uh, was offered to me has only been multiplied by spending today with uh, faculty virtually, of course. Uh, I did just get my second vaccine. So if I, uh, if I fade today, I will blame it on the vaccine. But uh, it does mean I can be there possibly in person in the not too distant future. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, speaking to Purdue. And I, I didn't know, but congratulations, Mung, on the fourth uh, place. Uh, I think fourth is is, is probably a, the, the most prized place and that one, two, and three uh, almost certainly have bought their way to those, uh, those uh, places by uh, endowment and alumni. But uh, well, I can understand why you're in fourth place. It's a fantastic uh, institution. And I, I'm actually going to give a talk that ends up at Purdue in some ways, meaning uh, my talk is going to propose the need for a new way of innovating. And I could argue that Purdue is set up ideally to be that innovation environment. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. It's gonna start on with a talk on the nature of innovation. One of the things that people often ask me about because of my roles is how do I see innovation and successful innovation I'm going to talk about in particular. Uh, I'm going to talk about sustaining and disruptive innovation uh, as well, which some of you will be familiar with from Clayton Christensen's work, but I'll give my own take on it. Because what I want to do is show that we're at the dawn of a critical new innovation era around industrial automation and the need to uh, automate our physical world and physical processes. Uh, but the challenge is going to be innovating what is now a multi-dimensional complex system, uh, which I think requires a new innovation model. And so that's where I'll end up is proposing that we need a new innovation model and, and open up. I have a view on, on that, but I, I actually think uh, Purdue and, and Among's leadership and, and across the university uh, can play a very leading role there. So as Dimitri said, I'll stop periodically, but feel free to send in questions um, and, and interrupt me. I'm gonna try and get this done in about 40, 45 minutes, and then we have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. Okay, so uh, let's start on the journey to create the future. And we're gonna start by uh, thinking about uh, the terms in innovation uh, and invention. So Alan Kay, many of you may know, is a famous computer scientist, and he had this uh, very popular quote. He, he's almost more famous for this quote than his work. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. It's very pithy and seemingly wise, but it does not tell you what to invent, right? It simply says you should invent the future. So you need to combine that with an even older guy, and here is a relatively old guy, uh, equally smart, maybe even smarter, Plato. Uh, and he was the one who came up with the phrase we commonly use as necessity is the mother of invention. You see the way he said it was a little bit more historical, but necessity is the mother of invention. So if I combine those two comments about invention, you could argue that uh, the, what it asserts is that uh, you should invent what is necessary in the future. And that seems somewhat trivial as a statement. But uh, I think it's, it's relatively powerful. It talks about necessary things for the future. And that's where you should start focusing your intention. But there's more to innovation than invention. And that's uh, where I'm going now. So another very well-known individual, uh, Thomas Edison, 
said, vision without execution is hallucination, a particularly favorite quote of mine. Uh, so what it says is, if I translate it into invention term, invention without a implementation is a hallucination or is a maybe a piece of marvelous academic work, but it's not something that can change humanity until it gets implemented. And in fact, that was also uh, conceptually uh, framed by uh, an economist who actually ended up at Harvard, a guy called Joseph Schumpeter. And he said, innovation is the market introduction of a technological or organizational novelty, not just its invention. And this is absolutely critical, is that true innovation, and this is where I'll sum summarize this first slide, is you have to implement your invention in the marketplace for it to be an innovation. Otherwise, it's just an invention. And that's critically important because it tells us quite a bit about what we need to do. It says we need to understand the marketplace. We need to look forward into the future, but also understand the present reality and then invent and implement solutions that get us from today to that necessary future. So let's build on this a little bit more. So that's the basic definition. Innovation is invention and implementation. It's not actually strictly additive, but we'll, we'll leave it uh, as that simple formalism. But I wanna take it a step further. What I would argue is that doesn't tell you whether it's successful. It says you it's necessary, but not sufficient to invent and implement, but you actually need it to hit the market at the time that there's a human need or a market need. So I've recast this as successful innovation is those two things, invention and implementation to the power of market factors. And again, the power is somewhat arbitrary, but what I do want to uh, suggest by that is that's the more important term in many ways, which, which often shocks people because logically or even morally, it seems like invention and implementation should dominate, but these following market factors often end up being deterministic. And, and they are, and I, I broadly describe them here, economic advantage, you have to have a cost or performance advantage relative to an existing solution. I call that a market factor because it's, it's to do with cost. It's not the invention per se, it's not the implementation per se, it is actually the economics of that, which are somewhat independent. Market timing is their current demand. Marketing is, can I create demand? Meaning if there isn't a current demand, can I create or increase that demand? And then there's an incumbency factor. Uh, do you have the ability to displace the existing solution uh, even if it's deemed not optimal? Is it displaceable or is the incumbency too strong? And then is it sustainable? Uh, can the existing solution catch up and overtake uh, or can a competitor come along? That sort of the selfish view is, can I win in the marketplace with my invention or will someone else win because they can offer an equivalent solution with other factors that favor it? So this is critical because if we want to change the world, if we want to create the future, uh, we need to invent, implement, and then also manage these market factors. And it's very hard to manage those. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but it's important, particularly as we look forward to the future, if we want to win, win meaning having a leading position in innovation uh, globally, we need to manage the market factors too. So I'm gonna put these concepts together. And again, now I'm introducing the idea of two types of innovation. There's disruptive innovation and sustaining innovation. These are well-known concepts to anyone who has uh, read Clayton Christensen's work. I like this little graphic here that I found, but fundamentally it says disruptive innovation often starts, and this is the key message, with lower performance in the key features uh, valued by the market. It has more defects and less speed less power, but it's, it's the beginning of the future. It's simpler, it's more economical, it's, it's, uh, it's more agile. So even though the thing uh, is not complete in its conception or implementation, it has the potential to overtake the more complete solutions that are typically arrived at by sustaining innovation. And frankly, the way to think of sustaining, sustaining innovation is satisfying customers' current needs and disruptive technologies focus on customers' future needs, needs they don't even know they have. And that's the critical thing. Real innovation, disruptive innovation, is about solving for a problem that the regular uh, company, the regular marketplace doesn't even see exists. So the innovator's dilemma 
as cast by Christensen, is how do I, as a company, uh, do things that are sustaining because I keep my business running forward, but I actually invent something radically different. And when do I adapt from the sustaining to the disruptive? And of course, he points out that most companies never adapt. What happens is one company is replaced by another. I did a little analysis of it, this in terms of my factors. My factors, if you remember, were invention, implementation uh, as the innovation factors and the market factors are the five factors here. And I gave them a nominal score. Again, nothing rigorous about this. The key is in this conception uh, that you could argue that the disruptive uh, innovation is actually better in uh, invention, uh, but less good in implementation, meaning it's a, it's a more basic implementation, if you, if you think about it that way. Um, and then on the economic factor, or the market factors, uh, it does almost as well in some categories, market timing, it can control a little bit. Uh, it can do well in marketing. You know, there's a lot of hype associated with new stuff. So it can, it can compete favorably with much bigger marketing budgets from, from larger companies. Uh, it has sustainable differentiation sometimes. Sometimes the sustainable differentiation is because you have a complex solution uh, or you have more R&D that allows you as a sustaining innovator to win. But the big factor, that changes here is initially the disruptive innovation has no incumbency and the sustaining innovation has massive incumbency. And that's the factor that switches the balance. And I'm gonna show this in a plot now, is all other factors being equal. The disruptive innovation fails until it can overcome the incumbency because its innovation factor, its economic advantage becomes preeminent and, and required by the market. And then that X mark I have for disruptive innovation becomes a massive check uh, because the incumbency becomes an impediment. So I wanna show this graphically. And this will be the end of my intro section and I'll pause for questions. If you think about what I'm saying, I'm saying that my successful innovation, innovation metric, which is the vertical axis here, starts by uh, in, the, in the sustaining domain with expansion of an existing technology. It's well-known S-curve of adoption and off it goes. And over time that seems to be doing well and it's highly profitable for the companies that make it. But really what then happens is this, we have a disruptive innovation coming with a lower feature set, lower successful innovation metric because it doesn't have that incumbency, but it moves with agility and speed and with economic advantage to gradually initially, but then very rapidly overtake the incumbent technology causing the uh, incumbent technology to, in very short order, be eliminated. And that's the dotted line down to the bottom as the new technology gets adopted. And this is a sort of classic take on the Clayton Christensen model. But you see that for a long time, the sustaining innovation looks like it's, it's doing just fine. Uh, and in fact, maximum profitability, as I mentioned, is at that point of the plateau. So it's, it's what's known in the industry as a cash cow. It's, it's printing money. Uh, when it reaches that plateau. So it's very tempting to say that world will last forever. If you look at it, it looks inexorable. It goes on forever until the dotted line kicks in. So this is the dilemma zone, as I would call it. And it in fact is the innovator's dilemma, is how do you navigate the sustaining innovation versus disruptive innovation space uh, as any type of company? Because typically, you are, if you're a successful company on the black curve, you see the red curve as in the rear view mirror or you know, almost invisible. Perhaps you have to look view it through uh, you know, high power magnification because it's almost invisible in the early phase of the exponent. And then of course it starts taking off, but by now it's too late for you to adapt to that because it already has, has a insurmountable momentum. So this dilemma zone is, is actually the critical period of time for the companies, marketplaces to, uh, to adapt. And what I want to argue for the rest of my talk, and I, as I said, I'll pause for questions, is we are in a new dilemma zone with a massive scope and scale, the, the topic of which is the next industrial revolution. And it's a complex landscape of many technologies coming together that have to be integrated to allow the automation of our physical world. Uh, and we're not well equipped in the current setup, I would argue, to navigate this dilemma zone. And other nations, particularly perhaps China, 
is better equipped because it requires a more coherent approach. So I'll pause here just for the intro, see if there are any questions, and I'll move on to what I think uh, are the ingredients in the dilemma zone and then talk about the innovation model going forward. Any questions yet, uh, Dimitri? Um, thank you, Marcus. Uh, we do have one question. Um, so would you like to comment on the work of Amory Lovins and Rocky Mountain Institute and his concept of integrated design for energy efficiency and of reinventing fire? Not yet. I think I'll, I'll save that to, to, the, uh, to the end where I'll, I'll address uh, that a little bit more. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll save that to the end well, for the Q&A session. Uh, maybe just a couple more um, that have just come in. Um, there's a colleague that says, I think of Alta Vista and Google from this diagram. Do you have any successful examples where companies were able to overcome the dilemma zone and become also the disruptive innovator? Well, Google, I would say, uh, was the disruptive innovator, admittedly in a bit of an open space, which was internet search, but there were others. There was Alta Vista, there was Yahoo, uh, there was uh, Jeeves uh, early on, right? Lots of, of these, uh, these search engines. And they obviously had a better algorithm with better scale. So uh, there was a the space was open, I would argue, which was sort of internet search. And Google won in an open space by having a better algorithm. So. Uh, I don't think the early Google uh, matches this diagram. I think uh, where, what it does is how the web scale players started owning large parts of uh, cloud and networking infrastructure relative to the telecom players, for example. I think what has happened in, in the networking or ICT space is uh, the web scale players use that initial entry point and, and, and uh, success to actually disrupt, uh, I would argue, the, uh, the ICT space in, in large scale and have frankly overtaken computing services, right, from, from the, from the uh, traditional offerers of, of uh, mainframe and, and, uh, and uh, cloud-based computing services. But I think that it does apply to computing infrastructures and companies. I think uh, web search was an open space. And it's great when open spaces exist, there aren't that many of them. Uh, any more, Dimitri? Wonderful. We have a few more. Maybe I will ask only one more right now because yep. it just follows up directly on what you mentioned and I'll save the others for later. Um, there's a question actually regarding the obscurity between the user and the infrastructure control, um, particularly as the internet is becoming cloud-based. And so the question is, does the loss of physical control of infrastructure uh, hinders our ability to innovate in the online marketplace or does it strengthen uh, by outsourcing management to others. Oh, wow, uh, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think I'll defer it to till I've discussed the industrial new reality because I think uh, the current web is not so interesting to me. It's the new industrial internet that, that I think is interesting. And that's where there's a new coupling that has to emerge because the system level uh, optimization is, is critical. I think with web services, which are designed to be best effort and work relatively well with uh, adaptive rate video, stream video streaming and, uh, and, and no reservation of bandwidth in the access domain, but just building out more and more capacity. That relatively simple paradigm has worked for consumer grade. I think with industrial grade services, there has to be a tighter coupling between the ones owning the infrastructure and the ones uh, owning the software systems, which is what makes it so interesting for in innovation uh, uh, epoch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get on to where we're going. So that was innovation, and, and that sets the backdrop for what we have to solve for, and, and this is where we get to the industry 4.0. If I look at over the history of, of uh, industrial revolutions, particularly the technological ones, you can read how I've characterized them here. Industry 1.0, somewhere around the uh, 1800s, uh, was mechanization of local physical tasks. Think a steam engine was only operating uh, statically in a, in a, in a location or in a relatively small scale. Uh, that's obviously where printing presses and weaving looms and automation of those things happened. Industry 2.0 actually then was the first sort of manufacturing. So larger scale mass production. So it was automation was a big uh, uh, focus in industry 2.0 rather than sort of mechanization was 1.0, automation 2.0. And, and yes, also increasing the scope. The idea is that it was producing 
vehicles and infrastructure that could travel larger distances. So there was an efficiency in that. 3.0 is loosely the internet age, uh, where what we did was uh, stop focusing on sort of physical tasks, but 3.0 was about um, physical media and digitizing uh, access to physical media. And then along came mobile as part of that, because when we digitize physical media, we could consume it anywhere. And that naturally makes sense if we, we, to tether ourselves to consuming digital media on only fixed locations really didn't fit with the logic. The logic is digitize something so that you don't have to be tethered to a location, a record player, CD player, whatever it was that you were using to consume physical media. So, so that, that was 3.0. 4.0 is actually then going to extend that. These things generally are progressions. Instead of just being mobile uh, access to physical media, it's actually kind of completely wirelessly controlled physical systems, allowing global access. And you, I think everyone in the COVID age understands global access, meaning access fr from anywhere, but with high order local optimization. So you're remote into something and then locally controlled. So the paradigm shifts from local human limited uh, tasks at the early stage of these industrial revolutions to global local combined, globally accessible, locally optimized and human augmented. And down the bottom, I've conjectured that the innovation leader was individuals, then industrial complexes that were built on industrial powerhouses. Then Bell Labs probably pioneered uh, the uh, industry 3.0 as Meng said. Uh, then a bunch of startups took those innovations and became web skills. And the question is, uh, who's going to lead the next industrial era? And that's what I'm going to talk about for the next few slides. So if I look at this third industrial revolution, it's always good to look at the present to understand the future. So what happened in the networking space is not much. This is the market capitalization of these companies. And I could have picked any company in the ICT space. And basically for the last 30 years, the internet age, they've bumped along uh, in response to market fluctuations. Nothing much has changed. They haven't added value, uh, which is shocking really, because they, these are the companies that pioneered the uh, ICT or internet space. The users in, of that space were these companies. And they've seen a massive uptake, Amazon for obvious reasons, with its, uh, its dot-com business and its AWS business, Apple with its device and device ecosystem, and now Microsoft. And what I like to focus here on is not the Amazons of this world, although it's interesting, or the Apples, but actually Microsoft, because Microsoft is a traditional company that took its enterprise offering, the Office Suite, made it available on the cloud on a next-gen infrastructure and available on any device, so globally accessible on any local device, and as a result has turned around its trajectory to look like one of the pioneering companies of the internet age when in fact it's a company that pre prior to that looked like it was on the same trajectory as the classical ICT companies. So the point I'm making is there's a possibility when we reimagine the future uh, of digitizing the physical world, focused on enterprise and industrial systems, making them cloud native, making them available on any device, but globally accessible, uh, that we, we generate tremendous new value. And so Microsoft in some ways on the slide is the bellwether of that phenomenon. It's not necessarily going to be the apples and the Amazons, but again, I'll come back to that question in the Q&A. So what is it we're trying to do? It's always good to, to frame the problem correctly. And, and here's how I like to frame it. If you look at this data from Robert Gordon, this is uh, his, uh, from his book, uh, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. In the first and then second industrial revolution is the blue bars and productivity growth this is productivity growth. So all of these numbers are growths on the previous number. It was going along uh, with a very uh, impressive growth rate until the 1950s. The internet age, which kicked in uh, uh, on the back of that, has led to a decline in productivity growth, or growth still, uh, and asymptotically going to zero. And this is a big deal because if you look, listen to Paul Krugman, the economist, his uh, quote is, uh, as you see, productivity is almost everything. And, and if you think about human endeavor, most of what humans try to do is increase the productivity of uh, our lives and systems and processes. And productivity, simply put, is the rate at which you, or number of goods produced per unit time per unit worker. 
Uh, and so uh, the reason we live in cities, the reason why we have uh, you know, larger scale agriculture and transportation systems is all about moving goods from point A to point B more efficiently to increase productivity. So it's hard to think of things in human life that are to do with commerce that aren't about productivity. You could even argue aesthetic things uh, are what you do with the time you create by uh, optimizing productivity. And I'll, I'll make that point in a, a little bit. So even aesthetic things are coupled to productivity as the companion function. So let's look at what has changed or is going to change, because this is going to be my thesis for the future. And it's a very important slide because I'm going to show you in the 2020s and beyond what matters is not what has been mattering in the last decade. So if we look over the decades of the third industrial revolution, the 1980s was about supercomputing. And the way to read this is the blue text means it had preeminent value or premium value and the commodity uh, functions or assets were the gray text. So 1980s supercomputing, hardware mattered. They were big complex systems and OSs like Linux mattered. There really wasn't a sophisticated network there weren't any applications and there wasn't a human machine interface, anything other than a punch tape or a clunky terminal. That's what HMI stands for, by the way. 90s, of course, Moore's law changes that. We move to a personal computing paradigm uh, and we move computing onto everyone's desktop. And I emphasize desk. It was an enterprise driven transition, not a consumer one, where we went uh, so that we could actually process data on office data or enterprise data on everyone's desktop. Uh, and that's when the apps start appearing, the office suite starts appearing, and human machine interface matters because it has to be much more uh, naturally appealing or intuitive for anyone to use. In parallel with that revolution, the, the 2000s saw the advent of mobile. And initially that was just mobile comps. And that's when the bubble of the telecom era happened because uh, this idea that you could mobile communicate anywhere was remarkable. Uh, up to that point, everyone had had fixed lines and, and your communications were defined by a location. And suddenly, if you imagine uh, conjecturing to someone that within a decade, uh, you could have global mobile communications and the infrastructure that it would take was massive, but it happened. Now, if you think about the 2010s, what really happened there was that uh, people like Steve Jobs recognized, and they, you can see the early origins of that in, in the Apple Newton, which was a personal digital assistant or PDA, uh, he realized that mobile computing was actually what the answer was. To so take the PC of the 1990s, the mobile telephone of the 2000s, and he merged them to create a mobile computer that consumed media and content, but actually became the basis of the current age, where more and more now we compute on tablets and smartphones that are very closely related. There's been a little bit of regrowth of, of, of of computing on on uh, on harder systems, or but even those are all wireless now, mainly Wi-Fi, and they're laptops. So all computing has gone mobile, driven by the realization by Steve Jobs that people ultimately wanted to compute wherever they are and not at a fixed location. So that's good. That explains the current world, but we're about to shift to solve a different problem. We've solved the problem of media entertainment on the go and maybe some financial systems we can access and e-commerce systems. But this is what we're going to do. We're gonna to move to solve the productivity problem. And for that, we need a new set of, uh, of values. And I'm going to talk about this more. The new value set has nothing to do with apps running on smartphones and OSs running on smartphones and, and mobile device hardware uh, that is you know, prized by consumers. The inversion, you see the blue text and the gray text uh, is going to happen where we, we still need human machine interfaces and I'll, I'll come back to that. But they will end up being more native to us. Uh, they will be more, there will be simpler devices. There won't be things we carry around like this device. So the hardware won't matter as much. There may not even be a, a, a sophisticated OS in that device. Think of in the simplest way, it's a, it's a sensory device. It's a sensory device with very simple hardware, no OS and no apps, because apps in some ways are a, a, a complexity that we don't need. What you really want in, in, in a, a future industrial system is the data coming from these new sensory systems, 
uh, running over a high-performing network to an edge cloud, I'll explain the edge cloud in a minute, to an AI-based system, or I call it augmented intelligence because humans are in the loop, that actually computes the perfect outcome and then signals that outcome back to another piece of hardware that actually executes it. And again, it could be a human wearing that piece of hardware or, or a robotic system. So, it, But it's a very different value system from the 2010. So I'm going to try and flesh that out for you a bit more. Is We are about to invert the value system like we have every decade. Um, but And there'll be a new set of winners in that space. But one of the key things is the AI system, the edge cloud, the network, and the human machine interface uh, system have to work seamlessly together because the performance criteria are much higher. So I just give you a, a sort of a, a context set. What COVID has taught us is what I have just told you isn't just wishful thinking, it's a necessity. If you think what we really learned in the COVID era is that we want to remotely control, interact, treat, assemble, manipulate, manage, diagnose, everything. Uh, because that clearly allows us to a degree of freedom that is important. Uh, and so remoting into everything, but uh, then having the ability to control all those systems, so it's that global access to local control. Uh, I think we've all now seen the light, whereas before it was an argument you had to make that that's what the world should be like, and no one really agreed, because we had this sense that you had to be physically present to, uh, to operate and manage a business or a process. And now I think everyone has agreed uh, the one good lesson from COVID is uh, there's a better way. And the better way is to be able to remotely access and optimize and perceive everything from wherever you are. But the problem of that is this, in order to access everything, you have an explosion of data. And this is a curve called the, uh, the uh, Buckminster Fuller knowledge doubling curve. And you can see uh, he conceived of it uh, in the 1970s, but his conjecture was that every half-life knowledge doubled. And this has just continued. And now you can see this place I call the IoT tipping point. This is where we're at roughly 2020, somewhere in that uh, place. We had this IoT uh, uh, paradigm appearing where devices would start signaling and dominating human signaling. We may be uh, not quite there yet, but we're on the path to something that is unconscionable. And why is it unconscionable? Because of this. This is human ability to learn. It's called the uh, Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And it's uh, based on a set of studies that say humans forget 90% uh, of what they've learned after 30 days. That's what the curve roughly says, if they don't refresh knowledge. So what we really have to do is constantly refresh knowledge, but we can't do that if of course the knowledge is constantly changing, it's just impossible to keep up with that. So this is where the paradigm of augmented or artificial intelligence helping humans to actually pass this massive amount of data, interpret it, present optionality, and then uh, allow humans working with machines to determine new outcomes. That's a critical part of this new story because we otherwise we simply wouldn't be able to operate on the massive amount of data we are generating in real time. We just can't con consume it. The way to think about this is something called Moravec's paradox that some of you may be aware of. He's a professor at, uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon. He pointed out that there's a conundrum or paradox that uh, humans and machines are actually optimized for different tasks. Machines can't do human tasks particularly well and they are movement, manipulation, perception because human machines have no conception of the physical world, yet we have been created and evolved to be experts in the physical world. Conversely, humans are not very good at mathematics, logic, data processing, and repetitive tasks uh, because we're not optimized for those things. Those are relatively recent changes uh, or uh, advances we've made as humans, but we're not optimized for processing those tasks. So in fact, the reality is humans and machines are always symbiotic. Uh, and in fact, I like this other quote by uh, Stephen Pinker, that the main lessons of 35 years of AI research is the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. And it's a recasting of Moravec's paradox. The mental abilities of a four-year-old that we take for granted navigating the physical world, in fact, solve some of the hardest engineering problems ever conceived. So this is a fundamental state of affairs until machines learn about the physical world, which is a complex thing to teach a machine given its limited capabilities and its limited sensory uh, uh, perception. So for the foreseeable future, what I see is humans and machines coexisting. And this is a way to frame this. If you think about it, what AI 
will be useful. And that means pure machine intelligence. It's high data replication and scale with very little knowledge of the physical world. That's the vertical axis. Human intelligence is good at intuitive stuff, if you want to call it that, compared to repetitive. Low data, meaning scale of data and replication of the task, but high knowledge of the physical world. And really what we want to do is blend those two things. And that's the, the gray space, creating what you, I like to call augmented intelligence, where we move from a best effort realm of humans ap applying a best effort in human intelligence, machines applying best effort artificial intelligence to a symbiotic world of human machine augmented intelligence. And in, in some ways you can think of the two realms in that triangle of human checking a machine at one at the upper bound and machine checking a human in the lower bound to achieve what you could call life and death or mission critical performance. So this is what I call uh, co-assistance or augmented intelligence. And it's gonna be foundational to that future we're building for the industrials. So I'm gonna go a little bit more into the industrial part and I'll keep going now because I want to finish up the talk and then I'll leave enough time for Q and A. One point I like to make is that we have to think about the human part of the equation here. And there's this famous hierarchy called Maslow's hierarchy about human needs, and you can read about it. His basic premise is human needs, uh, human aspiration is to achieve the top of the, the, the pyramid. Uh, so you start with basic sort of survival needs, and then you have esteem and cognition and aesthetics, and then learning and then teaching others. That's, that's the way to think about it. Uh, and the joke I make is this. In fact, we put free Wi-Fi or free wireless now uh, as, as one of the preeminent human needs, and maybe COVID has taught us that that's, that's doubled down on, on, on that. But there's a digital set of needs we have. And, and this think of this as in the digitizing the physical world. We actually need to be able to sense and connect and uh, access data from the physical world and analyze it and automate that, and then perceive it correctly in a, in a perceptual uh, device that helps us become, if you want, superhuman. So we've got these traditional human analog needs. We've got these new digital needs, which are dis digitizing the physical world. And the trick is we have to blend them. We're gonna blend these two things, our human and our human digital needs uh, to achieve new productivity. And if you think about it, uh, what I said uh, earlier is productivity is about creating time. You do something more efficiently, you create time uh, by automating and augmenting tasks, doing them more efficiently. But trust is also gonna be critical uh, so privacy and security uh, are critical in this new realm. Okay, now moving on to some of the infrastructure questions. Uh, this is just a summary. I, I will provide the slides uh, for anyone who's interested. But essentially, I'm identifying here what I will now show to you on the next slides. The fourth industrial revolution, in summary, is going to be uh, a set of the things shown in the green box here. And I contrast what was required in the previous industrial revolutions. But I'll move on in the interest of time. This is how I see human augmentation. I uh, fundamentally believe that these are the seven domains. We need to be able to think better. Uh, we need to have our identity and privacy managed better. We need physiological to mechanical systems. So let's think of those as cyborg. In other words, I, I can take a, a stimulus from my physiology and or, or neurology and control a machine. Uh, I need pervasive communications in, and, and more than oral or video. I need actually to have intuitive communications uh, with machine systems and other humans. Uh, I need to be able to perceive more completely beyond reading uh, or a virtual reality. I need some new perception system that allows me to be almost uh, uh, omniscient. And, and with AR, I really can be a, know exactly what I need to know at each moment of time, and that's, that's critical. I need to have enhanced senses. So maybe I'll be hyperspectral. I'll sense the world more completely, not just be limited by my five senses. And then I need to be monitored myself uh, to monitor my physiological state, uh, not just my mechanical or sensory state, but my deep physiology. Uh, and that, of course, helps with health and well-being. So these are the seven domains I see of human augmentation. Coupled to this, I need infrastructure augmentation. And I'm gonna start or focus with the computing systems and the networking systems in the middle, because these are foundational. They're a lot of what will assist the humans when I'm doing intelligent thinking and, and, uh, and, and passing of data for humans, I'm gonna be using augmented computing systems. And of course I need a networking system to, to either network me physiologically, a body area network, or connect me 
to an intelligent system running on the computing system. So at the center of the infrastructure systems are new networking systems. And I think of those as 5G and then evolving to 6G. And augmented computing systems include quantum and analog computing systems and uh, graphics processor-based computing systems and icing model computing systems, things that are optimized for processing physical world analysis. And around that, a set of other uh, infrastructure systems, and you can read them here, I won't go through all of them, but this is the complete set of infrastructure systems. And the way I see the world in future is that the infrastructure systems coupled to the human systems. Uh, and, and in fact, that's the new uh, playground, if you want, or innovation uh, scope that we need to foster. So you see how, what a challenge that is. If you think that building up mobile infrastructure was a, a massive challenge and building the internet was a massive challenge, uh, there probably weren't as many simultaneous domains of innovation that are going to be connected as what I'm proposing here. So a little bit on uh, money. It's always good to look at the market. Remember I said those market factors. So uh, this is a study by McKinsey that looked at this concept of IoT based productivity. And, and that was a, originally the report was called, called Beyond the Hype of IoT. And, and they really did a very good job of looking at the tasks. So the way to read this is there are six industries they picked, they're the horizontals. And each of those industries, they broke into seven essential tasks, managing, applying expertise. You can see that unpredictable work, data processing, predictable work. They said, what fraction of those tasks were automatable in a, let's say, a AI enabled, 5G enabled, highly sensorized world. And that's the percentages in these bars. So their conclusion was that in most industries, 40 to 60% of tasks were automatable. And if you automated them, it would result in four to 11 trillion of global productivity by 2025. And 11% of the global economy would be impacted, which means enhanced. GDP growth of 11% is enormous, it's unprecedented. So this is a big, big deal. And you see it's across all the industrial segments. This is a little bit more, uh, again, I'll leave this with you, specific types of tasks. Uh, but fundamentally, I, I, I want to use this slide to say, what I'm really saying is we have to sense the physical space. We have to predict a new optimum state of that space. We have to implement the new state. And then we have to monitor and manage the new state. That's what the new human machine uh, coassistance uh, regime is all about. And we have to be able to do that from anywhere which means local, remote, mobile, and fixed, and for all contexts and environments, which means live, real time. What a challenge, but what an opportunity. And I'll skip this, but it basically just uh, it reiterates that this is a large part of the physical world has not been digitized at the top. Physical industries represent 30% of, of our ICT spend, uh, whereas um, uh, they represent 70% of GDP. So physical industries, 70% of GDP, and we have not, uh, digitize them in the internet age, and you see their productivity growth of the of them of the physical industries only 0.7 percent. If we look at the digital industries I mentioned, media, uh, communications, uh, e-commerce systems, much smaller percent of GDP, but much higher growth rate. So the basic point is, we have this to realize: digitize the physical world and industrial systems, and uh, we will realize uh, massive productivity growth. The uh, timing imperative. If you look at what happened in the COVID era, again, what you saw is e-commerce growth was 10 years growth was achieved in three months. The reason, the infrastructure was in place. So what it just required was more software systems or platforms or scale to be deployed on top of the cloud infrastructure. So we were ready and, and those companies uh, did phenomenally well. Like you only have to look at Amazon's market capitalization, maybe Microsoft as well, uh, and companies like that to see uh, the, the uh, the leadership that is possible once you're ready, once you're prepared for the new reality. The trick with the physical uh, industry digitization is we have to build that infrastructure in the near term to be ready for leadership in the future. And again, I think that geopolitically, this is going to be a critical question. Digitizing of physical industries and physical infrastructure will define the leading societies of the future and the leading industries of the future and the laggards uh, will likely lose out to competition or other uh, uh, nations. So I want to just do a couple of things on tech, and then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the innovation model and I'll wrap up. The reason why we have to change everything, because I've alluded to this, 
that machines are different than humans, so therefore we have to change everything. But I want to really drive this point home. Humans have set up mainly to process data on a hundred millisecond uh, uh, time scale because that's how we that's about the time constant of our seeing, hearing, tasting, and smelling. However, machine systems or industrial control systems, as shown in this sort of generic diagram, if you look at the specs of those systems, which are in the table on the right, their cycle times uh, are very short on the order of one or a few milliseconds. And it's all to do with precision movement and precision control. Uh, precision in time is precision in distance of movement. So uh, to, to achieve um, very precise movement, you need very uh, short cycle times uh, from the control system. So this sets a 100 fold change in the specification of these industrial systems compared to human systems. The rather nice point is there are two things that humans are faster at processing, their touch perception and what's called the vestibular ocular reflex or VOR, which is how you perceive things in a headset. So by solving the problem for industrial systems and machines, we will actually at the same time solve a problem that allows us to interact with those machines in a more natural, intuitive way through touch perception and visual or ocular perception. So that's where you see the remote local control coming to the fore with humans and machines operating in perfect harmony. I want to highlight one more parameter, the availability of wireless systems, because all these systems have to be wireless to allow them to adapt and reconfigure in real time, which is how we're going to achieve a lot of the productivity growth. Availability of wireless systems of six nines is unprecedented, which is why we're going to need a new wireless network. So let's start with the latency imperative. That's that one millisecond latency. Fundamentally, we know the answer. Cloud has to become distributed because the speed of light is such that you can only travel approximately 100 kilometers there and back, so 200 kilometer round trip in a millisecond. If I need a millisecond control, I need uh, a less than a millisecond propagation because I've got all the application logic and, and the D D2A conversion logic and the queuing logic. So I need cloud to move to within 100 kilometers, maybe within 30 kilometers of those industrial systems. And you see already the predictions of massive growth in edge cloud compared to centralized cloud by many. In fact, it'll, it'll be almost as large as centralized cloud uh, in the not too distant future. That's just by speed of light. Here's the networking problem. And this is why 5G is catalytic in this. Uh, previously, we've built wireless networks that were really focused on capacity, consumer capacity, but they had almost no focus on reliability or latency. They were sort of two to three nines of reliability and there were latencies on the order of 100 milliseconds. So the shift from LTE to 5G massively changes both the capacity dimension, which is critical because they have all these systems coming online, but also the reliability dimension from three nines to six nines and the latency dimension from 30 milliseconds to one millisecond. So that's why you hear so much buzz about 5G. It's not about consumer broadband. It's about this being the enabling infrastructure for uh, the industrial future. Combine that with edge cloud infrastructure, and then all those, those uh, human augmentation and infrastructure systems I talked about, and you have the future. So I just wanna end on the innovation model. Uh, I promised I would get there and I just about got there in time. Fundamentally, I came from uh, Bell Labs, but Bell Labs had this interesting innovation model. It gets back to where I started, where why it was so effective is that the research labs and the product development and the market were all in contact. The market was owned by AT&T. The product development was owned by uh, the product division, which is called Western Electric, uh, originally in AT&T. And then Bell Labs did the foundational research. So it was a tightly coupled system. The market was known uh, and the innovation was directly delivered to the market. So it was the right innov innovation model because it was hugely successful, but for old market dynamics. Because the market dynamics now look like this. The telecom market is actually still there. Um, but it's, it's much now, well, it's, it's comparable to the web infrastructure market. Uh, but most of the innovative thinking is now happening in the web infrastructure market. And so what you have is a model where Bell Labs is sort of over in the telecom segment, you see in the gray segment, and not enough in the web infrastructure market segment. So although the innovation model remains good, 
it's got the wrong market coupling. And that's those market factors I mentioned at the beginning, if you remember. You can invent and implement as much as you want, but if you're out of touch with the market and don't control the market factors, you can't be successful. And so here's the problem going forward. And this will be really my last slide. The problem we have in this industrial innovation uh, that I've talked about is it requires coupling of all the systems. The research breakthrough, the initial innovation, the product development, the solution, up both the architecture, the integration, then the deployment, the operation of that, and then a feedback loop of that to optimize. And yet we are not set up, no one is set up to innovate in a coherent way across all those domains. And this is where I come back to my comment about Purdue. I would like to think that somewhere like Purdue, a leading engineering school, number four in the nation, with all its uh, myriad different uh, capabilities and uh, both sort of in industrial segment stuff and agriculture and farming and uh, outdoor systems and transportation systems, and it's leading engineering, computer science, mathematics, uh, is a unique place that could actually act as a virtual innovation hub that could innovate for the future coupled to the critical industrial markets that surround Indiana and the Purdue University as a whole. So this is the opportunity in front of us. And I think Purdue is uniquely positioned to win in this new world order. So just to summarize, the new driver is not consumer broadband and media and entertainment. It may feel like it because it's what we've spent a lot of our time doing during lockdown, but the new driver is industrial productivity. The new architecture I've mentioned, and I don't need to reiterate, uh, and a new era, which is human machine co-assistance. Not coexistence, co-assistance. And underlying that, the question I raise is, do we need a new innovation model? And I would answer yes. So I've just about done it in time with a few minutes left for questions. So uh, I will stop there and hope uh, it was informative uh, to everyone. Oh, Marcus, thank you so much. This was way more than just informative. It just really sparks our imagination. And thank you so very much. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, some actually of the questions that have already come in, um, you have already responded to. Uh, one question was related to uh, the role of academia in the industrial innovation that you described. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, I think the problem with academia is not knowing, not having market context. Uh, I hired lots of people into Bell Labs uh, from academia, and, and generally they would all agree that what, what they lacked was the right context. So they were solving problems that they thought were the right problems, but by not being coupled to the reality and daily reality, because you know in the market it, it changes daily or monthly, uh, they couldn't know they were solving the right problem. And I think that is the challenge for academia: is to be able to know you're solving the right problem. The other is then producing a product. Of course, academia isn't generally set up for producing products. Uh, so there needs to be an outlet. I think startups are one way, but startups generally go actually quite small and focused. And we're talking about a big innovation space here where it's grand industrial problems, not small problems. And even if it were, it could be reduced to smaller problems that a startup would solve. Those, those things need to be integrated. So the challenge of integrating a number of innovations that have a rich array of market contexts because they've got all these industrials is a big one. So I think what's unknown in my view is how to do it. I think I have an inkling. It needs to be a new type of industrial academic partnership and an innovation hub where everything gets sort of pre-integrated. And I think Meng Chang has some very good ideas in that realm, but it's not solved for yet, but it certainly is an individual innovators working in isolation. It's not recreating a Bell Labs at, at some level that's not possible across all industrials. So maybe there's an opportunity for a multi-dimensional engineering university to act as the anchor for such a new innovation uh, reality. And I will just ask just one more question um, because I know many of the other questions that are coming will be able to discuss in the panel following right after. Um, what do you think when you're hiring innovators? I know we have a lot of students attending this talk. So what, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I look first of all for super smart um, because uh, I, I think smart people who are open-minded and adaptive. So I'd say my definition of super smart is not just in one domain. It's really truly intelligent people uh, uh, think broadly. And so breadth is key because most innovation in my view 
happens at the intersection of different domains. So if you're expert in one domain, you should not uh, be unable to consume knowledge in another domain because that's where innovation happens on the boundaries of. Uh, so I like smart, broad, deep, uh, and I like driven to solve human uh, slash industrial problems. So I like uh, the application to a problem and solving it all the way to the end. And I like broad, deep and, uh, and human endeavor interested. So it's a bit of a, and then collaborative, I think goes, goes with that. If you're sort of humanistic, you tend to be collaborative, but collaboration is key because of the multidisciplinary nature and the multi-component nature of, of true innovation. Marcus, uh, on behalf of everybody here, thank you so very much for sharing your innovation, um, uh, your innovative thoughts, your ideas about future and about the uh, industrial um, revolution here. So uh, thank you so very much again. Um, I'd like to invite everybody who is here to join us in just about 15 minutes to the panel where we'll continue this discussion. Uh, there is a link right in the chat box for those of you who haven't registered yet. And uh, I would like to give our speaker just a few minutes to prepare for, for the panel. So thank you everybody for attending. And once again, thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, that was wonderful, thank you. Thank you all for uh, listening in and uh, I hope uh, it was helpful to you. It's a tremendous opportunity for us all ahead. <laughs>